So I guess I'll go ahead and start. So I was going to talk a little bit about using an effects framework for uh, some additional OpenGL testing. So first, I'm going to talk about, you know, why. And then what the hell is an effect and an effect framework anyway. And then talk about a particular um, effects framework that's, that's somewhat interesting. Um, and then sort of look at how that thing operates and see if maybe that is, is useful for, uh, for how we test OpenGL right now. So on the left is a piglet test. And on the right is what apps actually do. <laughs> um, so there's this, this huge, there's this huge disparity between what we're trying to do in, yeah, can we somehow kill the front? There's a huge bank of switches there. Maybe one of those will, uh, uh, it seems better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I do want to be clear. This is a super complicated piglet test. Most piglet tests, it, yeah, yeah. If the test passes, your whole window is green. <laughs> Which, on the flip side, is kind of an advantage of those tests, right? Because if you look at the window and there's some pixels that aren't green, it's pretty obvious. Oh, that isn't working right. And you know, the the image of the splattering zombie head, you know. Is there a pixel wrong in that image? Hell if I know, right? So, you know, there, there is some, some advantages to it, but it, it, it goes deeper than just um, the, the, the image that's produced at the other end. So here is a fairly complicated shader from a piglet test. It's, you know, what? Half a dozen lines of code that, that does some stuff and tests one specific targeted micro thing. And then compare that to, you know, so, so this is whoops, this is a complex piglet test, and this is a very simple lighting shader, right? That does a uh, Cook Torrance lighting model without any textures, without any bump maps, without anything that would make it useful in a game. And we have almost none of of this in in piglet. Now, there's some. So we we do have a some testing infrastructure in piglet for running shader tests. Um, and there's some things about shaders like this that are really, really painful in the shader runner environment. Um, so this, this particular shader has a large number, well, a large number, uh, what, five uniforms that need to be adjusted to get it to produce different results. It needs multiple sets of vertex input data um, that needs you know, non-trivial specific, specific values, and while this particular shader doesn't use textures, we have some difficulty getting textures into um, piglet shaders. So kind of summarizing some of the deficiencies about Shader Runner, it's really hard to draw anything other than just a bunch of rectangles. Um, it's really hard to get extra per vertex data into, you know, along with your rectangles. So if you want to test something that does actual lighting calculations, you need things like normals and, and additional data like that. And um, while Paul wrote uh, for, I want to say, transform feedback testing, some, some infrastructure for doing that, it's, it's pretty painful to use um, in, in the infrastructure that, that he was constrained to, to working in, um, which isn't a knock on Paul at all. It's just that it's kind of awkward infrastructure to try and add stuff into. Um, you can pretty much use any texture you want in Shader Runner as long as what you want is either a checkerboard or the RGBW texture, which is the four squares of red, green, blue, and white. Um, and it's hard to set other OpenGL state that may affect the shaders. And whenever we find a new piece of state that gets added, either for a new version of the GL spec or um, because there's just something we discover we haven't tested, it requires a bunch of awkward hacking in the um, in the parser for the that parses the, sh the shader runner files, and that parser has kind of grown into the thing of of uh, nightmares. I mean, I mean, it, H it would terrify HP Lovecraft. Um, so, kind of one of our holy grails is to be able to 
rip shaders out of existing applications and feed them some kind of interesting data and, and use those for our tests. Now, there are a couple shader runner tests like this. Um, some of the, uh, from some desktop environment, and I'm blanking on which one it is now, some of their um, post-processing filters, uh, some tests that Eric added. K was it Kwin? Yes. Yeah, so there's maybe, out, so out of several hundred shader runner tests, um, there's like five that came from actual apps. Um, or, you know, it's approximately that, that order of magnitude. So, hypothetically, API trace could help, but then what we sort of end up with are these giant binary blob files, um, which, unless you do a lot of work to trim them down, are giant. Um, it's really easy to end up with multi-gigabyte API trace files. Um, Carl's done a lot of work on, on trimming support and, and being able to make that better, but it's, it's still a decent amount of work to, to trim it down to, I, I want to run this shader and draw something interesting through this shader and verify that I get the right results out of it. Um, and it, even once you have it in that state, if you have a test that, say, exercises some desktop uh, OpenGL 3.3 functionality, maybe you kind of want to port that test so that you do the same thing but in ES3, where the shading languages are slightly different. You have to do things a little bit different, and that's really hard and awkward to, to do. Um, and if you want to just create one of these from scratch using API trace, you, you know, write an application and then trace it, and that just seems stupid. Uh, so, and I have the same slide twice for some reason. Okay, so, <coughs> so what, what is an, an effect file? So there have been a couple of attempts over the years at these magic effect files. Um, there's one I, I think is cleverly called like HLSL effects for DirectX that kind of got orphaned by Microsoft years ago. Um, there was CGFX from NVIDIA that was kind of an encapsulation, really targeted at the CG runtime. Um, but, you know, after both those castles fell down and sank into the swamp, they're, they're building another one. Um, they kind of learned from a bunch of the mistakes of those. But in general, the, the effect and the effect file is an encapsulation of a collection of shaders and a collection of graphics API state settings that you then combine into a series of rendering passes to achieve some result. Um, and so these, uh, the effects can contain multiple passes. Uh, in, in NVFX, they can contain, um, they can create new render targets, specify texture resources, so you can in an effect file, you can fully specify this is the set of passes to do shadow map rendering and be able to generate your shadow maps for your object and then generate the drawing of the object. And there's a lot of really kind of cool ways that you can put things together. Um, so they've done a few, so the, uh, Tristan Lorch, I believe is how you say his name, um, or, although it might be a, a hard C sound. Um, has done quite a bit of work on this. He's released it as an open source library uh, hosted on GitHub. Um, he's done a couple of presentations about it. The, the URLs were way too long to be able to put in a readable font. So if you just do those searches, each of the, the presentations are, are the first hit. Um, <coughs> so, and, and both of those presentations, one of them is from, uh, the first one is from a talk that he gave at uh, Intel's, or pardon me, NVIDIA's GPU conference uh, around last March. And then the second one is the, the presentation at the OpenGL BOF at SIGGRAPH this previous August or July, whenever, whenever SIGGRAPH was. Um, I'm not going to go into nearly as much detail as, as, as he went into in, in either of those talks, but I'm going to give kind of an overview of, of the, the sort of the important bits. So here's a, a sample of what a, uh, an NVFX uh, file would, would look like. So you have these different blocks where you define shaders. 
Um, if a block like this, like the first block, doesn't have a name on it, that's a bit of stuff that gets prepended to, by default, gets prepended to every shader that you compile. So you can put things like all of your uniforms and version settings and enables and the kind of boilerplate stuff that you want to have in have be the same in every single shader, but that you don't want to type out 842 times. Um, then you can define, define individual shaders and give them names. So on the, the bottom left, there's three, three separate shader segments with you know, a bunch of elided text so that it would, it would fit in. Um, then you can have named blocks of, um, of, of state settings. So here's some state for that sets up sampler state. Here's uh, a block that defines a texture resource. Um, and with all of these blocks, you can have annotations, which are in these kind of angle brackets. So this, this texture resource has an annotation default file equals and then some file name um, that you can, that gets stored with these when the, the effects library loads this file in and creates a bunch of objects out of it. And you can, you can look at these and see, oh, okay, for this texture image, I need to load this file from wherever it, it comes from and then set the default sampler state. And then the actual effects themselves are these techniques that have some series of passes. So here it sets object VS as the vertex program. And it's when the pass actually gets created that all of the text referenced by this actually gets built into a shader. Because at this point, you know, over here, it doesn't have any way of knowing that this is a vertex shader. So it doesn't know how to compile it until it actually gets used in something. And then here it's saying, take these two shader snip snippets and combine them together to make a single shader. So if you had, you could have an additional, you know, instead of diffuse from texture, you know, diffuse from noise and procedural calculation and be able to combine it with this same sort of base snippet of code. So you can combine things into, into different configurations. Um, so then you have a bunch of actual program code that tells it, that tells the library, load this file, and it sort of treats these as a large database. You look up a particular technique, and then you iterate through the passes in it, and you tell it, do the setup for this pass, and it configures all the programs in the state and, and whatnot for that pass, and then you do your own, own drawing code. Um, so it also has some ways to sort of control how things are named and, and be able to separate things out in some different ways where you can put things inside of, 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 of namespaces and then be able to dereference them using namespaces so that you can put multiple different kinds of things in the, in the same file and still be able to, to reference them and keep the, the names um, straight. So it doesn't directly support mixed versioning as far as I can tell, um, or putting mixed like GL shading language versions, but you can kind of do that using some, some annotations and then having your, your code that uses the techniques be, be smart and know what those annotations mean. Um, so for example, here we would have a common bit of shader code that would maybe have some if defs in it or whatnot. So you could handle desktop GL or ES, have the different sort of preamble snippets for the GL versions, and then put these together into different named techniques or maybe put them inside of a namespace or something and then have an annotation that says, oh yeah, this is, this is the one for desktop GL and this is the one for, for ES, and then have your, your code that uses these techniques has to then be smart and know how to do this. <coughs> so NVFX has a few advantages over Shader Runner. Um, it has a really robust language for combining different parts of shaders into actual programs and then being able to combine those with different sets of GL state to do things. Um, one of the things that I didn't show in this is also in, uh, go back another one, in the different passes here, um, there are also commands for setting the, the, um, 
uh, the uniforms to the shader and it also has full support for being able to handle um, uh, um, uniform buffer objects where you would and be able to bind around different UBOs in in different rendering passes and um, and, and be able to control a bunch of that so it's it's really quite functional there are a couple things missing I'll get to those in a, in a second um, it has a really nice mechanism that's that's pretty straightforward for associating different pieces of data with attributes coming in into vertex shaders it obviously handles multiple passes and handles off-screen render targets so you can do FBO rendering and then use that FBO as a texture in another rendering pass and you know be able to do those kinds of things one of the one of the example effects is uh, a shadow map uh, rendering pass that shows how to you know, first render it from the lights point of view into an FBO and then the next rendering pass is render it from the cameras point of view using that previous output as as a texture um, and with some clunky kind of hacking you can be able to put in multiple shading languages and have them all live in this one place so you can put shaders for desktop and ES or multiple versions of desktop GL um, all in a single shader file and be able to pull out the right sort of specialization of a particular technique um, but the method is kind of clunky because the, the the file format itself is completely dumb about what you put in the shaders it doesn't do any parsing at all of so in these blocks back here where you have these uh, GLSL shaders it does not do any parsing of anything that's in that it just has a yeah, it does do, yeah, that is the only thing it does. It does curly bracket, you know, counting so that it knows where, where its end curly bracket is. And uh, you could, you know, with if defs, you could easily trick that and, and completely break their parser. That was, when I, when I saw the, some of the example shader files, that was the first thing I went and looked at. It's like, how, do they make, how are they making that work? Is it relying on the indentation or are they curly bracket counting or, and, and how is that going to break? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it, oops, it does have not a huge amount of documentation, but a, a decent amount of documentation for the format of the file, of the FX file itself, and how you can combine things and, and put them together in, in different sorts of ways. Um, they uh, at the other presentations they had also talked about that they're working to get this integrated through some plugins with um, some DCC tools like I believe they have a working plugin for Maya right now and they're working on plugins for some other things so you can just directly import these effects files and, and be able to author them straight in in tools um, that's not too terribly interesting for people wanting to make piglet tests because duh. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to learn Maya just so that I can make tests um, but it is just a text file format so it's really easy to, to edit and be able to combine other other kinds of sources so the disadvantages are it's still E even with their their open source parser library and the, that does that handles the database and everything um, there's still a pretty significant amount of of code that you have to write to be able to to use it um, we have a lot of the same kind of code I mean if you look at shader runner there's a huge chunk of it that is parsing the shader test file and then there's a big chunk that actually goes through and, and runs through the test so it's approximately the same order of magnitude of code as that that block that we already have in shader runner um, so I don't I don't I haven't decided if, if it's how, how terrible it is that we would have to write more code um, it doesn't have any direct integration with any models or any actual data streams so uh, sort of the 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 view that they have is that you would have some some separate you know model files uh, that were generated with Maya or whatever that would then reference in it say 
these surfaces use this material, and then that material name is the name of some technique out of the effects file. So they have kind of a, a, a backwards view of it from what I think we would want to have in our testing environment where you know, we would maybe have a small set of standard models that we'd want to render stuff with, right? We'd want to do a bunch of our shading tests on, we're just going to render the teapot with a thousand different materials, right? So we've got the one model and a thousand different materials and we just want to use them all with, you know, that model and know how to hook up the, the data streams named in the effects file with the data that's actually provided in the model. Um, so it's kind of a, an inverted view. Um, there's also no transform feedback support, which given the, the way that you can create other sorts of rendering feedback loops in FX files, seems kind of weird that that's not there. Um, but Shader Runner doesn't support that now anyway. Um, it would be nice if it could. <laughs> So it would have been great if we had gotten a pony for free, but, but not so much. Um, there's no direct way to verify the results of the rendered image. You know, pretty much all of the shader runner tests are, here's my shaders, here's some small amount of state setup, draw a rectangle and probe a couple pixels or probe all the pixels and expect them to have some, some particular value. And there's no way to specify requirements for an effect. Like this effect needs to have GLSL 130 supported or OpenGL ES 3.0 or, or anything like that, which is uh, you know, one, of th one of the important things that's in all of the shader runner tests so that we know if a particular test can run on the system that you're on. Um, I think that their assumption is that you have some different mechanism for conditioning um, where different versions of effects live, that maybe you have all of your effects are generically named, and then you have separate effects files that live in different folders, or that the files themselves have a different naming convention, or something like that, depending on um, the versions of APIs that are actually supported on, on the system where you're running. Um, and the thing that really irritated me was it only builds on Windows right now. I really wanted to like put together some some tests of this and have a demo, but you know, coming coming soon is building on not Windows. So that that really irritated me. Um, it uses CMake, so it probably wouldn't be that hard to get it to build, but you know, Getting something to build and run on the first new kind of operating system is always the most painful. <laughs> so you can be sure that if it's you know a big pile of code written by you know one or, or a couple guys that are predominantly Windows developers, there's probably some stuff that actually only works on Windows just you know by accident. I know that we do the opposite thing a lot. In, in Mesa code where, yeah, this totally works in GCC and then, you know, explodes in a fire on some other compiler and then, you know, Brian yells at us. <laughs> Brian or, or Vincent or someone, yeah, you put declarations after code, you bastards. <coughs> um, so the kind of $64,000 question is, can we make use of this thing in, in Piglet? Um, and it seems like not as is. Um, I didn't see a really straightforward way to implement the kinds of tests that we already have hundreds of, right? Which are these, I've got some shaders, I want to draw a bunch of little quads with some slightly different parameters and be able to poke at their values. There wasn't any obvious way to, to be able to do that. Um, so we could probably extend the format or wrap something around the format to, to, to make it so that we could do that. Um, but that would take some, some additional work. Um, there was also no obvious way about getting in vertex data. Uh, you know, it's the, the assumption is that the models come from, from somewhere else. So we would need to 
develop a bunch of conventions about how the effects name things and where they expect data to come from, which we already have in Shader Runner, right? We've started naming a bunch of things, Piglet Vertex and Piglet Normal and Piglet Texture Cord and, and things like that. So we're already kind of migrating that direction anyway. Um, and then have some set of, of standard model files that we would want to do more a advanced kind of rendering tests with, you know, teapots or the, the dragon or, you know, a bunch of the, the standard kinds of model files that already have a bunch of the, the auxiliary data that, that, you know, texture coordinates and normals and tangents and, and things that we'd want to be able to look at. Um, now, what would be really awesome is if we could somehow take a trace file from API trace and say for this drawing command or this small block of drawing commands that you could kind of highlight that you know have some sort of set of drawing commands that all use the same vertex data and be able to highlight those in the API trace GUI and say generate an effects file that that does this and then rips out the shaders and rips out all of the state setting and just generates the the effect file that did that um, then that would certainly make it a lot more interesting, right? Because then that, that would get us a big chunk of the way towards our, our holy grail of having these, uh, these complex shaders that we can then edit and tweak and turn into other sorts of, of tests. So if we can't use it directly, is there some stuff from it that we could buy, borrow, steal? And, and I think that there is. I mean, it's. It's a really nice file format, and it's really easy to work with, and they have a really decent parser. Um, their syntax for doing textures and, and state setting is really clean um, and very easy to understand. And unlike a lot of the other state setting stuff that we have in Piglet, I wouldn't have to go back and look at the Piglet source code or look at other tests every time I want to, how do I set the texture wrap mode, you know? because um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So maybe what we could do is extend Shader Runner so that instead of having shaders in it, you have a block of here's kind of an embedded effects file and then just rip that out and send that into the effects framework to, to parse and generate its database. And then in our test segment, be able to say, okay, now I want to use technique foo and maybe you know iterate specifically iterate over the passes and then call out the drawing commands and the uh, the probe commands might be a sensible way to uh, um, t to integrate it and and kind of strike the balance between what we have now and this this other tool that does a lot of stuff but isn't quite there yeah it is I would have to go back and look at it. I looked at it, and I'm not a license expert, but it looked like a BSD-ish license. Um, but I looked at it for like two seconds, and it did. It, yeah, it didn't have it didn't have anything that instantly jumped out as egregious to me. It didn't say you must assign all copyright to your soul back to Nvidia or you know any kind, any kind of weirdness, you know. Right. Yeah. It, it, it had a bunch of the usual, there, there's no warranty, you don't, you can't use our name and, you know, a bunch of other sorts of stuff that, that looked familiar, but I was kind of looking at it more on technical aspects initially, and then if it, if it passed that muster, well then, you know, then maybe talk about licenses. Um, so I haven't, I haven't really looked at it too much. Is it? Okay. Right, yeah, that would be the other thing is just, yeah. Uh, I, I did mention buy, borrow, or steal their code. <laughs> um, so kind of where I ended up with this is not really sure what exactly to do with it. Like I'm kind of on the fence as to whether this is, you know, starting to integrate this is, is a useful way to get at some addition, additional kinds of tests or if it would just be a bunch of work that would kind of sit and and sit. So I know there's a bunch of folks in the room who have written crap tons of shader runner tests. 
So I'd kind of like to hear back from some of you guys what you think about the, the file format and how you, how you specify, especially the, the different state settings. Because that, that's, that's one of the places where I find Shader Runner to be the most lacking, right? We don't really have any tests that do that many interesting things setting different different kinds of state. We end up, you know, um, in, a, in a bunch of those kinds of cases, we end up writing sort of one-off C code tests. And it seems like if we could do more robust state control in Shader Runner, that a bunch of those, those other kinds of tests might become obsolete. Want to have any thoughts about that? Right. Right. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Right. And that is the nice thing about it is it's easy to do easy things. Right. That makes sense. So, sounds like Which, which is one kind of cool thing about, about Shader Runner is that you don't have to screw around with all dot tests <laughs> or CMake. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. I can see that. Because then it's, wh where, where, the, where the hell do you set a breakpoint? <laughs> So how much of the stuff, though, I mean, on the flip side, there really isn't any, in Shader Runner right now, there really isn't any debug infrastructure in it f other than if the shader fails to compile and you dump out the compile log. But there is other s things, you know, using ARB debug output and some other kinds of infrastructure that we could potentially utilize in that. And do you think that that would help in some of those cases? I mean, obviously, it won't help in all those cases because a bunch of the stuff is really driver specific. <laughs> well, it's as useful as the driver makes it. Right. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah, that's believable. Yeah, and so that is uh, yeah, and that is the other the other open question is in general if you're doing if you have more complicated shaders, how how are you validating their output? Um, and that is, I don't necessarily have any answers for that. So it, it it's it started off really simple and clean, and we've gradually added duct tape to it to the point where now it's just the world's largest ball of duct tape. And somewhere in there, there's a really simple core, but it's just. <laughs> We could, you know, go back and refactor it and rewrite the shader runner parser to not be the madness that it is. And that's kind of been, I think you hit the nail on the head with why it's so awful looking at the parser code in it is everyone who comes along just needs to add one teeny tiny little thing. So instead of cleaning up the steaming piles of stuff that's there, they just go ahead and add their, their one extra nugget to the pile. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> yeah. uh, two um, you the slide of the disadvantages Yes. I I have not. I have not yet. Um, this was just right. Yeah, and for a few of the things, I think that they probably would be. Um, some of the other stuff, since they're not making this as a testing tool, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they didn't want to, to clutter. I mean, they, they really want it as an, auth uh, as, as, as an interchange format from, from authoring tools, and so, that, so that people can use it in, in production pipelines. Right. Right. And so, you know, some of the, the previous kind of effects files, um, like CGFX and, um, oh, there was an authoring tool that ATI made. I want to say Shader Toy. Was was their their kind of integrated tool that had a similar kind of form file like this that it used internally, and that there were, you know, places that their intro to graphics class was just using that tool to author a bunch of stuff, and they had some some sample models. You know, here's your your teapot model data. Now author some shaders that do fong lighting on it, or or whatever, um, and so you know, a bunch of those things were just authored in this. And so if you search around, you can find a bunch of, you know, example code that is in some of these, the, the, the older effects file formats. Um, NVFX is new enough that I don't think that there's 
um, you know, a wide amount of, of code already available in, in this format that we could, you know, look at. I mean, as far as I know, they only announced it, its existence at all back in March at GDC. So um, it's, it's too early to tell what the, what the uptake is, is going to be. Right. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Uh, so. Wow. Seems like madness. Uh, oh yeah. So, so the question was, are, are, is kind of the, the disadvantage of this sort of endemic in that these are, that this is trying to solve a really different problem domain than what we're trying to do with, with Piglet, that the, the, the green rectangle tests are on purpose because we're micro testing. And I think that part of the problem is that we're micro testing because, I mean, one, micro testing is good. Right, it lets you, I've implemented some new feature and I want to exercise exactly that feature. But it's also the only hammer that we have, so that's all that we make. And making anything other than micro tests with the current infrastructure just seems awful. I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even want to try to attempt it, especially not in Shader Runner. In, in a standalone C test, you know, maybe do that occasionally, but in Shader Runner, Blah. So and, and I guess my follow-up question to that is, was, um, what does this mean in terms of how we define our pass and fail criteria if we're going to start thinking about doing more complex tests like that? Right. And so I, and I think that the answer to that is that you have to be careful about which pixels you probe and how you condition the data that goes in, right? I mean, we do have a bunch of tests right now that do some calculations and then compare the result of that calculation with some, some error metric. Um, and we don't necessarily have to do that in the shader code, right? We could do that on the outputs of what come out of the shader. So we could have our shaders, instead of outputting, you know, 8-bit RGBA, out output them to, it, at least for more advanced shading language versions that require other GL functionality, you know, output them to, to float buffers and do our, our error metric um, on the float buffers. And I mean, it isn't, you know, five or eight years ago, there was a lot of variation in the calculations that GPUs did because some people had 20-bit float and some people had 24 and some actually had single precision representation, but, you know, the the quality of their multipliers wasn't, or their dividers wasn't all that, but there's a lot less variation now because a bunch of the APIs demand, you know, especially DX has some really specific re requirements on the precision of different kinds of calculations. But your triangle rasterization is still different between every yeah. graphics chip. We've seen that with the, um, we have the, the GLSL ray tracing tests which basically we ripped all of the testing out of them because there was no way that we could, I mean, th there's like a couple of pixel probes left because we couldn't get anything that would pass on different sets of hardware while actually probing the whole image. Um, I, I think the only way to handle complex tests like this really is to, 
basically have somebody look at a series of images, bless them on some specific hardware and say, yes, this is what this hardware should continue looking like in the future, and then save those images. Um, and that doesn't really sound like Piglet to me. <laughs> right. So I thought in, in API Trace there was a tool that did a perceptual image diff. So, I'm just wondering if, if maybe 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 that's the tool, right? That you have a yeah. I, we, I hate this term. I have a golden image, and right? So we we in in Cairo we did a lot with uh, you know image based test suites, and we played with a lot of different perceptual uh, diff uh, algorithms. I don't know if we use the exact same one that's in API Trace or not. Um, we well, th well, the for one thing, when you do have a lot of um, handwritten sort of piglet style, a few green boxes, a few red boxes, the perceptual diff things always mess those up badly. They end up saying, "Oh, you hardly." You, we need to know, like, "Oh, I changed one red pixel popped up. That's a definite failure, right. and it'll blur that away." So you you have to be ver very careful to separate those in the first place. Um, but even after we did that, we I. Th I, I don't know what the current state is now, but at one point we were th we threw away all the perceptual diff code because it just caused more problems than it ever solved. We always had to go through things manually and mark golden images anyway. Right. So um, it's been a few years since I've looked at it. If things have gotten better, and like I said, I don't know know exactly which algorithm is in API Trace, but my uh, experience in trying this kind of thing is that that ends up not being worth it. Mm. Okay. So then maybe the whole thing's just a bust, <laughs> <laughs> which is is an answer I'm okay with. I mean that's kind of why you do experiments and and look at at other stuff. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yep. Someone pass him the mic. <laughs> I don't want to repeat what he's saying. <laughs> uh, image diffing, yeah, can be hard, but I think it's that's not a reason to just totally give up on it. When you're rendering, rendering a typical scene from a video game or something, which is very complex, and you want to know if it's right or wrong, um, yeah, you can use image diff different diffing to get an idea of if it's within a certain tolerance or not. We do it at VMware, and it's automated, and it pretty much works. Mm -hmm. um, I can see the cases with the Piglet green rectangle test. It's not the kind of tool to use there, but... Um, I, I think it is feasible, and it certainly beats manually comparing images all the time. Okay. So, do you, get, can you comment at all about the the perceptual diff algorithm that you guys use? Since apparently it's working at least acceptably for you, is it? Since, I, since yeah. I know a bunch of a bunch of your guys wrote a bunch most of the. I, I would have to talk to Jose to know exactly what okay. he's doing. Um, but he wrote a lot of the code that's in API Trace, so. Uh, pardon? He wrote a lot of the code that's in oh, yeah. API Trace, so it's yeah. at least possible it's it's the same. Yeah, I, I really offhand, I don't know what he's doing for image diffing, but we do use it, and okay. for the most part, it works pretty well for us. Okay. Okay. Well, then with that, I think I will go ahead and close.